So why use an active filter? Well, active filters are great because they have very low output impedance. And that's very useful if you want to cascade multiple stages together to build higher order prototypes from these individual different stages. The typical stage you can see here uses a single op amp to provide a second order char characteristic. And because it's an active filter, it can also provide a gain of greater than unity, i.e. we can amplify the signal if we want to. So one very commonly used filter structure is known as the Salon Key Network. It uses a single op amp and four passive com components to form a non-inverting characteristic with high input impedance, and it's a second order characteristic. Also, we have excellent gain accuracy in the passband, which is quite a unique factor of, the, factor of this filter. Moving on, we have the multiple feedback filter. This looks similar, but actually has five passive components. It provides an inverting characteristic, high input impedance, it's a second order characteristic, but the one thing that's great about the MFB filter is it provides excellent stop band behavior, much better than the Salon Key network. So, so far we've talked about a generic Salon Key network, as you can see here. However, in practice, we want to actually simulate and build a low pass filter. So how do we do that? Well, we need to replace the Z terms in this schematic circuit with actual resistors and capacitors. And if we do that as shown here, we build our second order low pass filter. What characteristic does it have? Well, we need to work through the maths to do that. But if you do that, you end up with this expression here, which is a classical second order low pass filter with a cutoff frequency omega naught and a damping factor. However, there's still quite a few unknowns. There's two resistors and two capacitors to calculate. We're going to cover some more details on how you actually come up with those values towards the end of this presentation. However, for the moment, if we plot out a generic characteristic, you can see here that beyond the cutoff frequency omega naught, the blue line trace here, the gain, drops off at about minus 40 dBs per decade. So we're going to have a go at simulating and building some one of these filters just to get a feeling of how they work and then we'll come back later on to have a look at how to calculate and fine tune the parameters. So let's simulate this and see what we get. So simulation is a useful step to help validate our circuit before we actually build it. And luckily for us, there's a version of PSPICE available from TI for free. If you go to their website at the link below, you can download it. And it's a very useful tool to actually simulate our filter and check everything's okay. So what you can see here on the left-hand side of the screen is our simulation circuit. We're using an OPA1611 op amp here. And for our resistors and capacitors for our low-pass low filter, we're using a 1 nanofarad cap for both capacitors and an 8.2K resistor for both resistors. Um, for those particular components, we chose those values just to give us a basic cutoff frequency of about 20 kilohertz. So let's simulate this and see what we get. Here we go. So on the right hand side, you can see what we've got here is an AC sweep. So we're sweeping frequency from the input side here. This is a, um, an input amplitude of unity. And we sweep the frequency from 10 hertz all the way up to 10 megahertz. And what we're here doing is plotting the gain through to V out, which is this top curve, and the phase shift through to V out, which is this curve here. And you can see here, if I move my cursors, in the pass band, we've got about zero dB gain, so unity gain. As we get up to 20 kilohertz, if I set it to exactly 20 kilohertz, there we go. The, uh, the gain is about minus 6 dBs, which is what you'd expect from a second order filter with a cutoff at 20 kilohertz. Um, and the phase shift is about 90 degrees at that point here. We're halfway to the 180 degrees phase shift. What is interesting from this simulation though, because this is a Salon key network, you can see the stop band. We've actually got the gain diving down at about 40 dBs a decade here, but then it starts to pick up again. And this is a consequence of how this particular circuit works. But this is very useful. It shows us we've got a 20 kilohertz corner frequency, which is useful to know whether our filter's working. We can vary around the filter component, capacitor and resistor values. Um, we've also put some tolerances in here because one particular uh, simulation we can do is also to look at the tolerance analysis with a Monte Carlo um, simulation. So let's turn that on. Let's edit the simulation profile. Turn on Monte Carlo. And what we've specified here is that the capacitances we've used for C1 and C2 have a tolerance of 10%, which is typical for ceramic caps. And the resistors we've used are about 1%. So let's simulate that and see what we get. It's 
This takes a little bit longer because it's actually running about 100 simulations now. There we go. We'll plot them all out. And you can see here now we get a spread of characteristics. And if, if we zoom in on my cursor, you can see for each plot we've got very slightly different gain and phase shifts. And that's, that's due to the tolerance of the resistor and the capacitor values that we've simulated here. If we turn the um, Monte Carlo simulation off, there's one extra simulation I'd like to show. Let's run it again. We'll plot an extra window here. In this window, we're going to plot the input current, or actually, we're going to do one divided by the input current because that gives us an idea of the input impedance of our filter. Um, it's rather difficult to see here, so I'm going to change this to a logarithmic plot and also make this curse, this trace, a little bit thicker. There we go. So here we go. If I turn my um, cursors back on again, you can see here in the pass band of our filter, we have an input impedance which is very high. So down at 10 hertz, it's above 10 mega ohms. As we get to one kilohertz, it's still above about 160K, something like that. So this is a very high input impedance for our filter. Um, this sort of simulation tool is a fantastic thing to, get you a, to give you an easy feeling of, of how these filters work. So I'd encourage you to download a copy of this and have a bit of a play around with it. There's a really useful blank PCB from TI which allows you to build up all sorts of different op-amp circuits. We will use the Salon key section for our prototype test. Firstly, we break out the Salon keyboard from the panel and get our surface mount components ready. After applying solder paste, the surface mount components are positioned and a hot air gun is used to apply sufficient heat to cause the solder paste to melt. Doing this manually requires a steady hand, but with a bit of practice, it is possible to get reasonable results. Make sure to check under a magnifying glass afterwards to make sure there aren't any shorts. With the surface mount components fitted, flipping the board over allows the through hole RF and inline headers to be soldered in place. Once this is done, we make sure to clean the board again to remove flux. If left on the PCB, solder flux can absorb moisture and lead to corrosion. Flux residue can be removed by using a special solvent to clean the board after soldering. Here we make sure to clean both sides of the PCB before putting the board on test. Here's our lovely clean PCB, ready to power up and run tests. With our plus and minus 5 volt DC supply rails fitted, we connect in the SMA RF connectors, which allow us to measure the filter response in the frequency domain using our vector network analyzer. However, in addition, we connect scope probes to the input and output signals so we can monitor the time domain waveform simultaneously. This helps us to see what the filter is doing in both the time and frequency domains and aids understanding of the system. Here's our test running. The network analyzer output frequency domain data can be seen in the bottom right of the screen and the scope time domain is shown in the background. The test is performed with input frequency scanned from 10 Hz to 10 MHz to match our simulation. The scope time base has been chosen to allow the sine wave close to 20 kHz to be observed. Below 20 kHz, we are in the past band of our filter and the gain in both time and frequency domains can be seen to be about unity as expected. As the frequency increases, we begin to observe a reduction in the output sine wave on channel 2 of the scope and a reduction in the reported gain in the frequency domain. Phase shift is simply a delay in the output signal relative to the period of the signal, and this is clear to see in both time and frequency domains. With the scan complete, note the inflection point in the gain curve at about 2 MHz. This compares very well with what was predicted by our earlier simulation. So, as described earlier, we need a methodology to work through and calculate our values of resistors and capacitors based on the desired co crossover frequency, omega naught, and Q factor. The problem is, is that we have four parameters here, two resistors and two capacitor values, but we've only got two equations, it means we can't solve that. So how do we go about taking this through to a solution? Well, we can define two new parameters, M and N, which define the ratio between the resistor values in the case of M and the ratio between the capacitor values in the case of N. Now if we do that and work through the maths, we get some simplified forms for the values of omega naught and Q as shown on the slides. 
And the great thing about the omega naught value is it doesn't involve the values of M and N. So we can set the corner frequency without choosing M and N. And then the Q value is purely a function of M and N. So we can actually design our Q factor irrespective of the omega naught value. And this is great because it decouples the two parts of the filter design we want to have. And therefore we can design our characteristic accordingly. So this is great. We now have a methodology to help us to design our filter. And I'd like to use this methodology to come up with a few different filter characteristics and benchmark their performance. Firstly, we're going to set a few assumptions. We're going to set the value of M, i.e. the ratio between the resistors to be unity. And the reason for doing that is that then means our equation for Q here, shown in red, becomes just a function of n, so we can independently control the Q of our circuit just with that one parameter, which is helpful. We're also going to choose a resistor value of 8.2k. Now the reason for doing that seems somewhat arbitrary, and this is really just engineering judgement. If you set that resistor value too small, then you'll start burning a lot more power in your filter. But if you set the resistor value too high, then the effects of noise or input bias currents on the op-amp can cause you real problems in your filter. So you need to choose somewhere in between, and a few kilo ohms is typically where you want to start. Lastly, we're going for a corner frequency of 19.4 kilohertz, and the reason for choosing that is that well, that's what the corner frequency is on the filter that we built and demonstrated earlier in this video. So let's tabulate out a number of different filter characteristics now with increasing values of n. So filter A, we set n to be 1, and in that case Q is 0.5, and that's the filter we built and tested earlier in the lab. As we start to increase the value of n, we start to see the capacitor values differ a little bit, as you'd expect, and the value of Q starts to climb. And if we plot these different filter characteristics out against one another, you start to see some interesting stuff. So, our filter, filter A, has a relatively calm transition from the pass band to the stop band. This is the blue line at the bottom. But that transition band is relatively wide. So if that works for your system, that's great. However, some designs require a much sharper transition between the pass band and the stop band. And if you can live with a bit of gain peaking here, then the Chebyshev filter allows you a narrower transition band at the expense of that gain peaking. So it really depends what your application wants. You can also plot out the, the uh, pole locations of your filter on what's known as a pole zero map. And that gives you another way of looking at what's going on here. So the pole zero map here, this is our filter that we built. And that actually has two real poles. There's no imaginary component to those. Uh, and this really means it's the equivalent of two single, or single first order stages uh, put in series. As we move into the characteristics such as a Bessel, Butterworth and Chebyshev filters, the Q starts to increase and the complex poles start to have an imaginary component with higher Q moving you round, the, round the, the curves here towards the imaginary axis. And this is the Chebyshev filter here. So this pole zero map is another way of visualizing the behavior of your circuit um, to understand how the filter is going to behave. Now I really hope that this filter introduction video has been useful for you and we're always open to comments. See you on the next video. Bye.